Hey y'all, 4019 with Head Frame Hunters here with episode 2 of the mining series. So we just used the 911 to remove some waste material from the assay lab and uh, trash from the shop. And we're gonna come over here to our little jaw crusher. This is like a 6x10 unit. Real small, but use this for uh, initial sample prep. Gonna run those three samples that we, uh, chip samples that we took in episode one, and also uh, some surface hand sort and tailing samples from uh, another property in New Mexico that we're examining as potential mill feed or source. So from left to right here in the lab, we've got our uh, riffle, or sample splitter, our chipmunk jaw crusher for finer work, and our uh, sample homogenizer, which is basically an agglomerator, and uh, pulverizer, which is uh, for real fine work. We don't take it down too far, I don't know, maybe 50 mesh, it's not a ball mill, but... Uh, mesh, mesh being the, uh, the size, so... The higher the mesh number, the smaller the particle. Like 200 mesh is dust. our BA or B001 sample after it's been run through the production jaw crusher. Now it's going to go through the chipmunk and the pulverizer. I got a fume hood in here to deal with the dust. And everything is blown off to minimize cross contamination. This is what's actually going to go through the pulverizer and then be fused. So apologies for uh, missing the sample prep, or the, the fine sample prep, uh, where you're adding other reagents, you know, uh, bone ash is one, uh, so we've got some floor spar, nitrate, down in that red tin is uh, lead litharge, or lead monoxide, then uh, 
Yeah, here we've got our furnace running uh, about 1950 degrees, crucibles, and uh, these down here are bone ash cupels. Or, uh, it's just running the, the sample fusion in the in the crucibles, and then uh, eventually we'll get to the cupellation stage. But uh, that might be a separate video. Uh, this right here is a uh, tongs for pouring out crucibles. We're going to pour out into one of those molds there, de-slag them, remove the silica, and you end up with a, a lead button, which then needs to be hammered into a, a cube, which is then placed in a, a cupel, fired. The lead vaporizes and is absorbed by the cupel and then you're left behind a doré button, which is gold and silver. At that point, the silver is dissolved in nitric acid, and then you're left with a gold bead. That is good. I know we've been concerned about it from that mine. There's a little bit in that one. See how it's a lot thinner? I do. So for our viewers, uh, floor spar means that the ore is essentially unsuitable for use as smelter flux and has to be run through a mill. We can't just sell it to uh, Freeport or Sarco and make some money that way. There have been a lot of mines around here make a lot of money selling flux. Well, the bad news is that that low, that low vein one that we pulled, that's the thinnest flux. It's either high silica or high force bar. Here's oh. hoping for high silica. But we'll have to have a whole rock done on it. Yeah. Now, I'm curious about these... Uh, These last three. We got a button on them, so it's good. Didn't look like a cannonball. It's gonna be the, the two of the vein material where there's real cannonball potential. Always wear your safety glasses and don't try this at home. Remember, kids, safety third. We could do the uh, the whole Mythbusters spiel. And there you have it. That's uh, a full round of uh, six samples fused. They'll have to be de slagged and cupelled. That's just right, so it cracks the surface but it doesn't explode. And you also want to give it enough time for any uh, molten lead to work its way down the bottom. That one should let cool down a little bit longer. I'm gonna put some cupels in. So this is the uh, the deslagging process. This is the uh, the button from the bottom of the uh, sample. You can see the ones over there that have been hammered into cubes. That's the end state. Just uh, removing all this green silica slag off of it because all of our ore down here is uh, coarse coasted. You end up with uh, glass. Yep. That happens a <laughs> lot. Keep 
you've never truly worked with something until it's tried to run away from you. Honestly, these tend to average about four or five times per button for me. Now we're getting the buttons in the cupels in the furnace set to uh, about 1585. Just losing some heat with the door open, which is why he's closing it a little bit between each. Energy efficiency, as much as you can do. Should have used the insulated gloves, that's getting a little bit toasty. Yeah. This is, uh, this is post cupellation. These are the Doré beads left over. The uh, whole lead button is uh, evaporated or absorbed into the crucible. He said uh, it was 3.8 grams of silver. It was the uh, Yeah, that's the end quart you add with silver so that you actually you always have a bead that you can pick up and handle. Now you notice the color difference between these. This is a well, mostly new cupel that I was using as a fire or a damp. Uh, draft block and then one that's been cupelled in that's the lead oxide it changes color because it's absorbed all the lead oxide those uh those doré beads then weighed on this microbalance which is kind of a delicate process then placed into uh sulfuric acid in those crucibles I'm sorry, nitric acid in those crucibles. It's pretty strong stuff. What that will do is dissolve the silver and then leave behind a gold bead. It's been placed on a hot plate just for a little bit of heat to catalyze the process. So uh, there's a misspeak in the previous clip. It was uh, 3.8 milligrams, not 3.8 grams. And these ran anything from about 4.1 up into the, uh, the 6 gram range. So uh, not great, not terrible. The initial two, uh, number one and number two samples didn't run. Uh, it didn't run especially hot you know, unless there's a lot of gold in there. But the, the one lower down, it was decent. We'll be uh, waiting on the final numbers because the gold value is going to be uh, the, the silver value is going to be that, that 3.8 in court uh, minus the gold minus the uh, actual measured silver value. And the, the gold value is just whatever's left behind after the dissolution process is complete. You can see that the beads are kind of dancing around to the bottom of the crucibles as they're off-gassing. This uh, number four sample, which was uh, some hand-sorted vein material from uh, another mine in New Mexico. That one seems to be pretty active. This one on the top right is uh, our number three sample down the decline. That's the one that I'm you know, the most hopeful for that material is done decently in the past, but I think it's kind of spotty. But we'll see how it shakes out. I'm just gonna wrap up episode two here. Uh, it's actually another day. I was out here tinkering a little bit on the young buggy, messed around with this orbitral a bit, 
seemed like uh, it wasn't quite sealing properly. Uh, soaked the hardware there with some rust converter. Got the steering wheel uh, tamped down. And it seems like it's stopped leaking by a fair bit. I'll pick up a steering wheel puller. I would pull the wheel, replace the O-rings and bushing in there at some point. So the number two and the number one samples that we took underground, those didn't run much of anything. Uh, you know, trace gold, ounce or two of silver. Uh, nothing real spectacular. And the third one we took, it also wasn't great, but it was uh, about a tenth ounce gold, I believe about two ounces of silver, so about $200 rock. Uh, not bad, and considering as it's interspersed with uh, up to $800 rock on uh, you know a single eight foot wide vein exposure, I think it's probably worth mining. So I'm gonna work on getting the gimbal on my quadcopter unstuck. Because uh, that's been a problem lately. Get that unstuck. See about doing a, a recon flight of, uh, of the claim on the surface. Identify for sure where the monuments are. Because we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt where the monuments are. Make sure it's properly monumented and everything. And from there, potentially take a survey. Now, our hope is that the shaft is the center of the claim and, you know these hard rock claims are i believe uh what is it 600 by 1500 feet so that could give us up to 750 feet of strike length from the shaft and remember we're maybe 50 feet from the shaft where we were sampling that could give us theoretically up to 750 feet of strike length of ore. Now, we're not going to be that lucky. I think if we get 250 feet and 50 feet of vertical extent, we should be overjoyed. But the, the point stands that if the geometry of the claim is what we believe it to be, and uh, maps of the district show that it is oriented along the strike of the vein uh, in, that, in that area, we could have access to a fair bit of ore in there. So we're, we're quite interested, and we're going to be pursuing it further. Just, uh, I wouldn't quite call this a teaser, but this is, uh, doesn't belong to me, but it belongs to a, to a friend. It's a Galleon 160 Series L motor grader. And it does run, but it needs some TLC, but it might end up getting used to uh, work on the roads up in the district. Just uh, potentially something to look forward to.